This talk is uh, the politics of JavaScript, and the motivation is really, I love the community, the JavaScript community, but I'm a little bit troubled by what I've been seeing recently in that community, and I want to talk about that, and I want to propose some solutions. Um, don't know if you can see this. Um, I, I sent a tweet out a few days ago uh, as I was working on my slides uh, and realized how many f f famous people. Uh, I said, so far my slides for web directions include Lenin, Napoleon, Nelson Mandela, Dick Cheney, a sad puppy, and a plate of french fries. And my friend and colleague at Twitter, Palaka, replied, guess you're missing to add It's Friday song by Pekka Black as background humming music. And I was really tempted to actually add that, but you'll be happy to know I didn't. I'm going to start with a brief survey of the JavaScript timeline, um, starting with what I'm calling the anarchy years, which was um, roughly the first 10 years, where you got stuff like this. Um, anyone else old enough to remember ex Expert ex Exchange? Um, OK, looks like I'm the oldest one here. <laughs> so um, it was a real cut and paste culture. And it was full of urgent requests for urgent code. I uh, need to fix this tomorrow. Everything was in the gl gl global scope. I could just copy your code and run it in my code, and everything was supposedly fine. Uh, then Ajax came along, or at least Ajax became available to everyone. And um, that was quite a revolution. And, um, JavaScript began to be taken seriously with things like Google Maps, Gmail, and those kind of things. And then, for the next three years, um, JavaScript really showed its good, its good side. It really began to be taken seriously. Um, here's a few, a few uh, reasons for that. Um, there's Kangax there on the, on, the, on the left, who's uh, probably my favorite JavaScript developer. I've just learned so much from him and from his blog. He did a lot to, to make JavaScript uh, a serious language and let the, the idioms be, under, be understood. Um, there's CoffeeScript, which has done a lot to open up the language to other people who wouldn't necessarily uh, be going into it. I wanted to mention Prototype, which is a framework which is not is used very rarely now, or not by many people. But I think they made a great contribution to where JavaScript is today um, by enabling first cross browser code, ironed out the differences uh, between browsers. But it also, um, as we'll see later, um, sort of engineered a lot of the changes that ES5 later took up and, and made it official as part of the, the language. It's also great code base. If you ever want to just read the code, and I learned a lot of JavaScript just from reading through uh, Prototype and seeing what they were, they were, they were doing there. It t t taught me a lot. Um, also, I should mention Firefox and Chrome, two browsers that really led the way um, with helping JavaScript developers both in terms of performance and uh, in terms of making developer tools available. So then the last three years is what I'm calling the itch. Um, JavaScript is continu continuing to flourish. More and more code is being written in JavaScript than ever, and that's really, really great. Uh, but it's also sort of the age of anxiety is what I'm calling it. And it, there's a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. Uh, and um, sort of uh, th these are three quotes from leaders in the JavaScript community. And um, th they're actually mostly good. I mean, I agree with, I don't agree with the f first one, but I strongly agree with the second and third one. Uh, but they're indicative of the anger and the, and the tr tr tribalism. Um, 
people started to take sides, and JavaScript, it turns out, is very easy to take sides on, and the internet helps to foster this kind of tri tri tribalism thing. And there's a sense that people are happier to take sides and talk about what they, what you tell people what you should do without actually having experienced them and written the code. Uh, and that's a big issue, and, and I'm going to talk about that. So um, it, it, now on to the main part of the talk. Um, in, when I decided to call my talk politics of J JavaScript, I started looking at uh, political, political an analogies, and it turns out that a lot of political terms um, fit exactly into the kind of struggle we're seeing in the JavaScript community. So I've divided this talk into five or six sections, each of them um, named for the p political uh, or the, the, um, the, the uh, p political uh, analogy that I'm trying to draw. So let's start with paternalism. So you hear a lot, uh, JavaScript is hard. Don't necessarily agree with it. Don't think it's harder than any other language, but you definitely hear it. Uh, uh, you hear it a lot. There's two ways we can go. We can either we can either learn JavaScript, or we can hide from it. And this kind of thing troubles me when when Douglas Crockford in the good parts um, says he's carved out a subset which is vastly superior to the language as a whole. So he's saying, protect yourself by denying half of the features. Half of the language features, I'm not going to let you have because you might <laughs> hurt yourself. Uh, I don't think that's a good way to grow the language. Uh, and this is another thing you just see everywhere on all forums, on Stack Overflow. Uh, no attempt to explain, um, just an overprotective uh, sense of, oh, you don't want to do this, you wouldn't understand, but just please keep away from this. Um, this, is a good, this is a good question. These kind of questions need to be asked. So, do certain people say to avoid the increment and, and decrement, um, decrement operators? People don't really ask why that is. Um, this is a great answer, and this answer actually epitomizes a lot of what I'm going to be talking about uh, t t today. So he says, part of me wonders if it has more to do with a lack of experience, perceived or actual, with JavaScript coders. I can see how someone just hacking away at some sample code can make an innocent mistake with plus, plus, and minus, minus. But, and this is the, the crux, I don't see why an experienced professional w w would avoid them. So we're all adults. We're all smart, or supposedly smart. Um, just because we can go wrong with something doesn't mean we should avoid it entirely. And for somehow we got into a mindset, or, 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 or a lot of the internet, the JavaScript community has got into a mindset, stay away from this because it might cause you tr 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 trouble. Uh, and I think that this is a problem. Um, excessive constraint limits innovation. Um, language is going to go stale if we don't keep exploring. Uh, in that period from 2007 to 2010 uh, and on beyond that, we developed so many, so many idioms and so many great ways of, uh, of d doing things. And that's what I love about, love about JavaScript. There are so many ways to do everything, and the, the solutions are kind of there waiting to be discovered, and it's what makes it such a such a fun language. So, you know, you can limit yourself with innovation. If you want predictable, try, try Java. There's only one way to do everything. So you could try Java, or you could try Canberra. Uh, sorry, I probably shouldn't have put that slide in. I've never actually been to Canberra, so I don't know. But I, I understand it, it has a reputation. <laughs> Here's some code. Um, you see this quite a lot, something like this. Um, there's um, basically saying quit the program. If x, the argument x is undefined, just quit the program. Now, th there's a type of check there, which is not really necessary because a, a reference error could never be thrown. 
X is already passed as an argument. It's already been declared. The only other reason you might use type of is because apparently, although I've never ever seen it happen in any code, and I've been coding a long time, someone could redefine undefined to something else. So because somebody wants, somebody is probably not even working in code at all, they once redefined undefined, now we're all stupid, and we have to guard against this every single time, which just drives me nuts. It's a bit like this, right? <laughs> um, yeah, sure, don't hold the wrong end of the chainsaw. We don't have to be told. Um, you know, people who use a chainsaw saw should be smart enough to not hold the wrong end. People who write JavaScript should uh, be smart enough and should respect their team and the third party libraries that, that, that they use to not do things like redefine, undefined. So back to our code. Um, we could instead just do this and say um, if x is strictly equal to undefined. We could actually do this too and say x double equal to undefined because, because, because null and undefined are equal, equal to each other and to nothing else. So now we've got two things. We can check, check null and undefined. And if we really were paranoid about undefined being redefined, we could do the same thing just by changing x equal equal null oh, because null is because null is immutable, so no one can ever can ever redefine it. So now you can see just with a little bit of understanding of the language and how it works, we've we've given ourselves a lot more options. And options means, uh, leads to good code, using the best tool for what it, the problem we are trying to solve. I hear this all the time, and it troubles me. We need constraints because most people don't know, because most people don't know JavaScript well. No, we need people to know JavaScript. We don't need constraints. We need people to learn how to use JavaScript. We're working with JavaScript, we should learn it. Least we could do is to understand it. These are a couple of respected sites, um, and they're both basically telling you uh, always use has own property whenever you iterate, every single time. Um, something terrible will happen if you don't use has own property. I think what they're getting at is the prototype. Um, properties will leak from the prototype, and you'll be iterating those too. Um, although you may want the prototype too. I mean, that's what prototypes are for. You may want to inherit properties from the prototype, but let's pass over that. So here's a code snippet. I'm creating an object uh, which doesn't have a prototype. Uh, but you know, they tell me I must use has own property. Mustn't forget to use has own property. So sure, let me put a has own property check in there. Oh, whoops, it throws an error. Uh, and that's because we don't have a prototype. We create an object without a prototype, has own property is defined in the prototype. So blindly following what these sites and these people, these, these respected community leaders tell us to do gets us into this kind of trouble. If we just pause to think for ourselves, why are we using has own property? Why do we need this? We'd have realized, oh, we don't even have a prototype, so I don't need to worry. And then the error would not have been thrown. So in summary, um, don't buy the code for the dumbest ideology. The gates are responsibility to educate ourselves and our team. Uh, holds us back, holds the language back. So part two, uh, the cult of machines. Machines are good. We all, you know, in our industry, we, we all use machines and depend on them. But we must strike, uh, strike a balance between uh, automation and humanity. You know, we as developers have a lot to, write, uh, to offer. That's why we write our code, and machines, for the most part, don't write the code. Uh, this is a little thing I called the traffic light paradox. There's a city in Holland called Dr Dr Drachten. This, what it, this is what it looked like in 2000. This is what it looked like in 2001. Can anyone see what happened? 
Yeah, exactly. They removed all of the tra tra traffic lights. And what happened, um, surprisingly to many people, is two years after the system was introduced, uh, travel times were lowered significantly and accidents were, 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 were re re reduced significantly. And the G G Guardian uh, newspaper ran an editorial on it. And it really struck me the analogies we can make with what they were saying here to what we should be thinking as programmers. Uh, accents as well as congestion. So we can think of congestion as being related to performance. Are reduced when motorists show greater individual responsibility. So learn how the code works. Learn how to use JavaScript uh, so you can have your own opinion uh, rather than mentally switching off to behave like automata. Automata being um, listen to what the machine tells you should happen. And here's a case in point. This is a bit of code I used. I actually stole this code. It's, an, it's, a, it's a natural compare algorithm. Um, I'll, I'll show the full credits for this at, at the end. But what it does is basically compare two strings and see which is actually first, um, including <laughs> numeric order. Uh, so I was using JS Hint at the time, and JS Hint told me, oh, you can't do this. You mustn't do equals equals. So I duly changed it to triple equals, and it broke the code. Again, blindly following what the machine told me I should, should do. And the problem here is CA and CB are characters of the strings A and B that we're comparing, and we're iterating through each character. And as we compare, um, we're looking to see if they're the same. And if they're still the same when we get to the end of the string, uh, and, and this is what we're checking for. Have we got to the end of the, of the string in both cases? Then we return zero as to say the strings are equal to each other. What the original code was doing was um, there's lots of ways you can end a string. You can have an empty string or you can have a return character or several other things. So rather than bother to triple equals and list all those things out, they just did a compare to zero. Now, admittedly, it might have been slightly more transparent if they had done a compare to empty string, because that gets to the point of what they were trying to do. But still, the code is actually pretty sound, and it actually works. And changing it to triple equals um, causes the error. So linters are great for catching tra tra trailing commas. If you ever need to catch a tra trailing comma, you use a linter. Um, but they suck at, at, at nuance. They've got no ear for subtlety, no ear for figuring out what we as human beings, as programmers, are trying to actually do with our code. Uh, and I hope that is the example just shows, um, shows, shows how that, that can happen. Uh, I really like this quote. I've liked this quote for a long time. Um, again, um, it's not a panacea. Consistency is not a panacea. Always doing things the same way is going to lead to, it's at least going to lead to not very expressive code. At worst, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to errors. Um, think for yourself. Um, JS Perf is, is really fun, um, but it's, it, it tends to be overused. And whenever anybody is reading an article or, or a presentation, uh, so many people will go to JS Perf, directly to JS Perf, oh, let me compare these things. Because we, uh, we as people like to, like to um, c c compare things and say either this way is the better way or, or or that way is the better. And one of the easiest things is to run it through through JS Perf and say, look, this 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 is better because it because of performance. But look at this expression. They're actually doing exactly the same thing because type of anything is always a string. So the left hand operand and the right hand operand are always going to be strings. So this is identical, and you can read the ES5 um, spec. The steps are identical. So it's totally arbitrary. One of them happened to be quicker than the other. Uh, equals equals in this case, when I ran it, happened to be 5% quicker. But A, it's running 2 million iterations per second. So, you know, you should not care. And B, uh, 
it's arbitrary. Uh, um, but you'll get people claiming, oh, it's 5% faster, so let's use e the equals equals. So uh, remember, JSPerf is fun, but um, not only uh, the point I just made, but also the browser vendors have got really smart to what we're actually doing. And they've um, optimized their code so it benchmarks really fast. Ever since Trace Monkey, ever since Firefox's Trace Monkey, benchmarking has become a really big issue and, and a way for um, vendors to advertise their performance. So case in point, split. So when you split a string, you generally only split once at a time for uh, a given string and a given argument. But Chrome, um, predicting that people would, would, were going to, to use split as a benchmark, they cache the first result. So you can split 500 times, and it's extremely, extremely quick. It gives the impression um, when benchmarking that, that split is quicker than almost any other way. It's not necessarily. Um, it, it's due to optimization for something you're never going to do. So uh, rather than uh, profiling arbitrary snippets of code, you're better off just profiling your real app, real life app. Obviously, be, be sensible when you're writing code. Uh, don't write code that looks like it's going to be ridiculously slow. But wait till you actually, you're actually done and profile your code. So uh, in my opinion, the more you automate your JavaScript, the more soul destroying it gets. So that, for example, JavaScript is to to G W T uh, as a plate of French fries are to a f f food pill. So a food pill gets you everything. It's it's nutritionally the same. In fact, it's probably slightly better than a plate of French fries. But it isn't any fun. All the fun has gone. And it's a bit like an automatic transmission car. So yeah, driving automatic transition is good. It, it'll stop you from crashing, from crunching the gears, and hopefully you won't crash the car. But you're doing it at the expense of control. And if you, you know more about the car, just like if you know more about JavaScript, you should take advantage of that and code in a way that offers you as much control as you can have. So summary, both machines and bad programmers lack new <laughs> ones. Um, use both with caution. Fear mongering. This is part three. So if you read the internet too closely, you'll never do anything because you'd be so damn scared of everything. Uh, these are actual snippets copied and pasted from real articles. Um, you know, there's not much left, really. <laughs> so uh, apparently all these things are bad, and you, you, you should stay away from them. Fear mongers assume the worst of everyone. They assume we're all idiots. Uh, Please stop worrying about this hypothetical thing of oh, someone could, could overwrite undefined and someone could overwrite has own property. Yeah, it it's, it's could happen, but it, it's highly unlikely. Uh, you know, petty pseudo contingencies. That there is likely to happen as someone overwriting object prototype. An object prototype would be completely screwed if that ever happened. And there's a bunch of other things that could easily happen. No one ever says to caution against them, even though the, the damage they caused would be much more widespread. So just, just make sure you work with people in libraries you, you respect. And, uh, and, and, and then you can code in a much more, much more optimistic fashion and in a much more expressive fashion. This is, a, this is a tweet I really like from Andrea Gimacci, who's a colleague of mine at Twitter. He was talking about another fearmonger thing, which is don't ever enhance native objects. Uh, don't ever enhance the prototypes of JavaScript, JavaScript native objects. And to be sure, you want to be careful when you, you're doing that. I won't go into it now, but it's not something you should just blindly go into. 
But his point was that the, 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 the ECMAScript standard, that JavaScript has got a lot from people who took the chance, the pioneers who actually did this thing, um, who did this extension early on. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, prototype, we, we all probably use function prototype Fine. Now that originated from the prototype guys who uh, who did that first and got adopted by ES5. Similarly, Motools um, did the same with string prototype trim. I'm sure you've all seen this quote here uh, from Jeff At Jeff Atwood, otherwise known as Coding Horror. Uh, Always code as if the person who ends up maintaining your code is a violent psychopath. Um, I'm sure he didn't mean it. I'm sure it's really tongue-in-cheek, but that, that is uh, really terrible advice. Um, <clears throat> good code doesn't work on, walk on eggshells. Um, you can't go around thinking that, that you'll never get anywhere. You need to be c c courageous. Um, and again, it keeps coming back to the same thing. Just know who your teammates are. Know what their th their knowledge is. Know what the th th third party libraries you use. Um, look at their code. See what see what's happening. Which um, leads us on to a more general case, which is JavaScript phobia. People are very good at other languages, but for some reason are irrationally scared of JavaScript. And we'll go to amazing lengths to avoid uh, having to c c c code in it. And you, you'll hear two things. You'll hear either JavaScript is so simple to begin with, or, and then that suddenly morphs into JavaScript is so hard and I can't, I can't possibly understand it. Wouldn't be, and, and, and I think the reason for that is, is something like this. So <clears throat> if you think of JavaScript as an iceberg, um, the syntax is what shows at the top, and it's deceptively simple. Um, it looks like Java or C++. So the ship comes on, the explorer sees the iceberg, and oh, yeah, that's just like Java, but it's even easier because the, there aren't any types or anything like that. And then the whale, whale is um, looking a bit further down and, and, and what's going on inside, and, and, and they see the uh, true stories. That's a very typical story for many people coming into JavaScript. And as a result, people end up very scared and they want to do something else. So um, that's where transpilers come in. And uh, Jeremy Ash Kanaz, who is here somewhere today, um, he wrote this excellent list of all the languages um, that compile to JavaScript. And I went through that list and I sort of divided them into two sections. There's JavaScript -y transpilers, which are basically um, working with the syntax rather than the semantics. So you get syntax transpires like CoffeeScript, which work exactly with the idioms, use the same idioms and the concepts that, that uh, JavaScript has, but, but, but puts, an extra, puts, a, puts a cleaner syntax on it, basically. Or ESX transpires such as Kaha that um, uh, transpires from ES5 to ES3. Or uh, things like TypeScript, which is a superset transpiler, just adds t typing to everything we have. So th those things work pretty well, and there's little or no signal loss. If you look at the, the generated code, generated JavaScript, it's usually clean, and, and it honors what the uh, original developer was, was trying. And then there's all the others, and there's too many of them to show here, but there's the un-JavaScript transpilers, which is just purely from one language to another language. And here you're converting semantics, which is problematic. There's a signal loss often, because JavaScript does some things. It has concepts like closures and first-class functions and a bunch of other things that those languages don't necessarily have. So you have to write a lot more, or the, the transpiler has to generate a lot more code to do the same thing. Um, expressivity is lost. If something goes wrong, well, you probably don't understand JavaScript anyway, which is why you're using a transpiler. But even if you did, locating in the generated JavaScript your original code is going to be very, very hard. And we can sort of, um, to illustrate how things are lost when you go from one language to another, 
Um, let's, let's talk about human languages. So here's an expression. Okay. The dog ate my semicolons, um, which I'm sure you've all used as an excuse before right, for leaving semicolons out of your code. So we can use Google Translate to translate that from English to French. So we get le, le chien a mangé mais something about that. And then um, let's go back from French to English. And it's now saying the dog ate my commas. Now, semicolon and comma are semantically completely different from each other. And so um, we have an issue. Uh, Hopefully that's an illustr illustration of how going from one language to another, we lose signal quite often. There we are again. So, um, you know, in summary, um, fear is the enemy of creativity. Uh, of course, a certain amount of fear is a good thing, but understanding the, the language, understanding JavaScript, helps us to um, c c convert blind fear into intelligent fear, where we're actually worried about the things we ought, we ought to be worried about. So uh, section four is ideology. In JavaScript, ideology, uh, you, could, you could rewrite that as tri tri tribalism. Uh, it, it's just people taking sides. Um, this is a tweet I saw the other day I don't know if he was actually serious about this, uh, but if he was, it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, he, he, first, he's not explaining anything. He doesn't say why. Now, admittedly, in 140 characters, that, that's hard, so maybe you shouldn't tweet such a thing. Uh, but it's offering a, a panacea, and, and he's excusing you from having to know anything about the way JavaScript works or the way triple equals works. Just saying, hey, forget about everything. Don't bother to learn it. Just just use triple equals, and things are going to be completely fine. Uh, and it turns out that almost any ideological position has an op opposite position, which is equally f f valid. And, and another non-coding example is the Oxford comma. Um, so who knows what the Oxford c c comma is? Yeah, cool. It's the, it's the comma that goes before a, um, a, before a conjunction like and or or. or or, or. So here's an example of where it would have been good to have an Oxford comma. So, so the first half of the, I, the first quote, ideological quote, is Oxford comma is essential. So we left an Oxford comma off here. Well, we left the comma off. Uh, my pointer is we left it off here. So this would be an Oxford comma if it, if it was before and. We left it off, and it makes it look like she has two children, a cat and a dog. Those are her two children. Oxford comma would have helped to clarify that she has two children and a cat and a, a dog. So yeah, great, great use case for Oxford comma. But the equal and opposite ar argument is you should never use an Oxford comma. And, 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 and look at this example. Through the window, she saw George, a policeman, and several onlookers. Uh, here we're using an Oxford comma, and it looks like George is a policeman. That's not what the author was trying to say. The author was trying to say there was George and there was a policeman and there were several onlookers. So, so many things where people take a strong ideological position, you can see there's an equal and opposite, equal and opposite argument. And almost a direct analogy for that, going back to the coding world, to the JavaScript world, it's remarkable how comma first versus comma last uh, is analogous to the Oxford comma thing and how you can prove both sides of it. You can have examples to prove, uh, to prove either side. Um, so uh, here is an object hash. And this is using the traditional comma last syntax. Let's remove the final item. Uh, now we have a problem, because we have a trailing comma. So fine, we proved that the, 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 the comma last can, can cause trailing commas. With comma first, uh, we remove the final item and we don't have the problem. Equal and opposite argument, but comma last prevents leading commas. It's an obvious thing when you think about it. So here's comma last. Uh, remove the first item, we don't have a problem. Everything's good. Comma first, remove the first item, now we have a problem. 
So watch out for that. Watch out for the, the ideological claims. Sayers' Law, um, paradoxically written by someone who wasn't called Sayer, said, um, in, in any dispute, the intensity of feeling is inversely proportional to the value of the issues at, st at st stake. So thus, uh, we have the semicolon, the semicolon issue. Everyone is familiar with semicolons. Everyone knows what they are and so feels very comfortable about arguing. arguing. Now, if it was like, is every function a cl closure or are, are only inner functions closures? A lot of people get blown away straight away by the terminology so they stay out of that argument. Those arguments are much more important to JavaScript than something like semicolons. Here was a famous uh, GitHub issue and 281 comments later, um, th this guy said, I just want to be part of web history, just adding his comment. Uh, and if you ever take the time to read that thread, it's just switching relentlessly from one ideological side to the other. And in truth, I don't care. I do not care whether you use semicolons or you don't. If you take the time to know how ASI, automatic semicolon insertion works, then fine. Don't use semicolons. If you want to use them all the time, that's perfectly fine too. It's not important, and we as JavaScript developers shouldn't be wasting so much time talking about them at the expense of the issues that actually count. So my final political analogy is absolutism. So this is a bit of a follow-on. Dichotomy is really attractive. We like, it. We like to classify things as either right or, or <laughs> wrong. And is this age-old programming concept, and it's earlier than programming too, of the one true way. So, you know, it's either JavaScript or it's CoffeeScript, or it's OOP or it's functional, or it's callbacks or it's promises. That's one, something that's been, that's an argument that's been raging on Twitter and various other places recently. Or it's comma first or comma last. Um, but it's not a science. It, really, programming is not a science. Uh, we're all just puzzling along. And the more, um, the more strategies, the more technologies we have at our disposal, the better position we are. So rather than always throwing out the alternative, we should, we should uh, embrace both sides so we have the right tool whenever we actually need it. And really, um, uh, in particular, for example, the, uh, the OOP thing, uh, it's, not a, it's not a one size fits all. You can combine OOP and functional in a very effective manner. Uh, and yet a lot of people should tell you, you should never use functional, always use OOP, or always use functional, never use OOP. Um, this is very common. Uh, the internet is, is um, overcome with style guides. Uh, 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 people who write JavaScript who want to share their style guide with you. And um, which, which is fine. I don't have a, a lot of problem with the first three things here. They, they, they really are purely sty stylistic things. And if, if myself and my team want to, to write like this, and I agree, everyone in the team should punctuate the code in, in, the, in the same way. So this is all good. But inevitably, the style guides um, end up um, adding a whole lot of very JavaScript-specific ide ideological absolutist arguments to the end. I, I see this time and time again. Again, no explanation, no consideration of whether it's just good for you or it's good for everyone. Uh, see this a lot. So uh, what it is, is guidelines. We all, when we learn a language, when we learn JavaScript, we hear the guidelines. And again, we like to make our life easy, and we mistake them for rules. So when we hear a suggestion, it's a suggestion. It's not telling us how to write code, but we like to be told, we like our hands to be held. So no globals ever. People take it too seriously. If, you, if you're using a non-AMD, non-module thing, you have to have a globals, basically. And they are a feature, too. And sometimes I really like globals. Globals can s save us a lot of extra work. Of course, use them sparingly. Of course, use them cautiously. 
Um, but, you know, you should use them. They are a tool like everything else, and there's a time and place for them. This is one um, you see a lot as well. Always use feature detection. So the idea is you can either, um, to see whether, you, whether your browser supports something, you can see whether that feature is supported, or you can see what the agent string, user agent string of the browser is, so you can see if it's IE or something. And in general, feature detection is much better than user agent detection because user agents, um, um, the, the, their user agent string is not very transparent often, and also uh, features can be added. Uh, but sometimes you cannot do feature detection, and case in point is object-defined property, which IE8 supports. They, they have an object-defined property, but it works entirely different from the standard object-defined property. So, I'd yet to know how anyone would use object-defined property without doing a user agent check. So again, um, let's watch the, uh, the absolutist statements. Um, they force people into corners which, which are hard to escape from. And as I was saying, every time we claim one side over the other, we're discarding a technique from the tool belt. JavaScript or any other language is just a tool belt of different skills, different techniques. And even though some of them we're hardly ever going to want to use them, uh, learning as many as you can is the best strategy to be a good, a good p p programmer. Um, having the ammunition there in case it, it, it is a really good strategy. Uh, this, is an, this is an airplane co cockpit. Would you buy a book called Air, Air, Airplane Controls the Good Parts? That's basically what Crockford is asking you to do. He's saying discard half, half <laughs> the language, uh, not to use half the language. I would not confidently uh, put uh, scotch tape over, over any of the controls here because you never know, even though you might have done 100 flights, never used them, they're good to have, and they're probably essential to have in certain circumstances. So, as promised, to wrap up, here's some hope, here's some solutions, here's how um, hopefully we can bring the community back together, get rid of some of the, uh, the, uh, the ideology, some of the anger. I love this quote from uh, Peter Pound. Does he, his Twitter handle is Kuvos. You might have seen him before. There are indeed many ways to do the same thing in, in JavaScript. That's one of the beauties of the language. Um, totally agree with that. It, it's a fun thing, and it's an educational thing, and in the end, it's a powerful and expressive thing. Um, and we can either learn one way of doing the many ways, and fight the corner, or we can learn them all and be informed. So w what is the ingredients to make a good coder? Well, this does not make a good coder, in my opinion. Being forced into a corner, being, being, being disciplined for some, doing something that a leader of the community might not agree with does nothing to foster understanding or our ability to uh, create idioms in the future, or ability just to write good, clean, expressive code. Um, you can't legislate against b b b b bad code. Uh, Java tried that. Java tried to legislate against bad, bad code. They don't let you get away with anything, and yet I've seen Java, bad Java code all over the place. Uh, you need to learn, you need to experience, you need to play. And this is, um, this is a great slide which I actually stole from David Nolan, who was at JSConf in 2012. Uh, he said play makes good c c c coders, and I think that's absolutely right, and, and I really like this. So opening your console and just trying things. Uh, one thing I like about the fact that JavaScript doesn't has, have a compiler, is it lets you run the code. It lets you see where the error happens. So rather than just um, saying, no, I'm not even going to run this code, 
it will always let you run it. And it, it fosters a greater understanding because you can see the exact point your code failed and what happened. Uh, and, 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 and you can actually learn from that. And, you can, and by learning mistakes, JavaScript is a language that allows you to make mistakes. And we can grow from that. Final slide. Um, we can rise above the fear mongers, the ideologues, and the absolutists. We can do that in two ways. Um, instead of joining a, a tribe and getting on t Twitter and making a blind argument, master the fundamentals. Just take some time. There's so many good, good resources out there to do this. So master the hiss and prototypes and coercion and scoping. If you learn those four things, you, you transcend the ideologues. You know more than they'll ever know. And you can stand your own position, and you've got opinions of your own. And again, experiment, play, have fun, and keep an open mind. That's it.